All right, so welcome to chapter 14. We're going to start talking about the brain. And this is going to be a fun chapter. Uh, I'm going to ask you guys to watch a few videos along the way. Um, you'll have the links in PowerPoint. Uh, so many awesome things about how the brain works. There's so many neat things happening all the time. We're learning so many new things every single day about how the brain works. So this is a fun, fun chapter. Okay, so let's get started. Let's see if I can get my slide to advance. All right hide me. Um, so I just want to talk to you about some of the brain structures so to get us started. Okay, um, so the, you can see here the major parts of the brain are these are these four, right? So we have our cerebrum, something called the diencephalon, that's composed of something called the thalamus and the hypothalamus. We have the brain stem, which is consistent of the midbrain, something called the pons, medulla, oblongata, um, and then the cerebellum. So when you look at these, you can the cerebrum or the cerebral hemispheres or the cerebral cortex, any of those terms are synonymous. Basically, that's all of this squiggly stuff, right? And for the most part, we're, and we'll talk about exactly what the different areas in the cerebrum do or what they're responsible for. Um, for the most part, you can think of the cerebrum as being the area that's going to be in control of a lot of your conscious thoughts and a lot of your conscious actions, okay? Um, the diencephalon consists of the thalamus and the hypothalamus, so you can, you can see the diencephalon. The thalamus is sort of this round area in here. It's going to be a major relay station in the brain. A lot of um, the actual uh, uh, nerves or neurons or tracts, I should say, come into the thalamus and then they'll go, it's like a relay station, they come into here and they go somewhere else. Or they'll come into here and they, they go somewhere else to your body. But anyway, the thalamus is located right here, sort of underneath all of that cerebral cortex. The hypothalamus, think of like hypodermis, right? So it's just below, that hypo means below. So just below the thalamus is your hypothalamus. We'll learn a little bit about the hypothalamus and what it does. You'll, you'll hear about it more in 202 as well when you get to the endocrine system. It'll be an important uh, endocrine organ. The brain stem then is going to be all of this. The, fo the rest of this, not the spinal cord, but the rest of this down here. So we have what's known as the midbrain, so sort of right behind the thalamus. Um, then we have the pons, this area right in here, and then we'll have the medulla just underneath the pons, and then after that you have spinal cord, which is no longer part of the brain. And then finally the last part is going to be the cerebellum, sort of this lobe, the very sort of in the occipital area of, of the head. Oops. All right. So the brain, because it's so important, um, we're going to have lots of different protective coverings, making sure that it doesn't get damaged, right? And we call these coverings the meninges. Okay. And we have three different ones. We have something called the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, sometimes you'll see called the arachnoid space, and then something called the pia mater. Okay. So let's, let me just get my pen. So this, the dura mater, is going to be the outermost layer. outermost, and is definitely the toughest. Okay, hopefully you'll see this in lab um, when you look at the sheep brains. Uh, this this layer is it's really tough. You'll have a hard time even cutting through it. Okay, so here on this image we see our cranial meninges, right? So let's just kind of take a closer look at this image. First we have skin, which is obvious, right? We have our scalp. Underneath that is a little bit of adipose. Then we actually have the bone. Um, and then this sort of greenish color um, is our first meninge. So here's the dura mater. And you can see it's pretty thick. It'll dip down between those the two different lobes of our cerebrum. Our, our cerebrum. Uh, and then, so that's again, the outermost layer, it's in contact with the bone. Underneath that will be this arachnoid mater. So I don't know how well you can see it, but uh, hopefully you can see these little white lines. Um, it, it, they call it the arachnoid mater because they thought it looked sort of spider webby like, so arachnoid and spider. So it's, it's the arachnoid, uh, the spider webby kind of material. Um, and then finally, the pia mater, you'll see this thin red line on the brain itself. So this is the innermost layer, right? And it's on the brain itself. So it's in contact with the brain. Really, and you'll see this again if you're dissecting the sheep brains, you really won't be able to peel off this pia mater without taking some of the brain with you. So it's in contact with it. 
Okay. Um, so basically, these are our protective coverings uh, along with the skull. They kind of make sure that the brain stays where it is. It kind of keeps that fluid that our brain is going to be bathed in in place. Um, and it, and it, it tries to keep the brain from, you know, bouncing around inside your skull. Obviously, with things like concussions, that doesn't always happen. Um, the brain can actually hit the bone um, and then damage itself like a concussion um, happens. The brain, interestingly, it's it's not really that large as far as weight, like your total weight goes. So it's a, it's about, and this is average person weight, right? Um, so it's only about two percent of your actual weight, okay? But it actually takes up a lot of the oxygen and the glucose um, in your body. For someone that's only like two percent of your weight, it's pretty hungry, right? Um, so this means that it's going to have to have a very good blood flow to make sure that we always get enough oxygen and glucose going to the brain. Okay, and As you can see here, the neurons are making ATP almost exclusively from glucose. Now, it can make it uh, using ketones, but not optimal. Okay, And, and there's no glucose. The, the brain doesn't store it, right? So basically, you don't have like a fatty pad around your brain. It doesn't happen. So, you know, whatever's in your bloodstream is what's going to your brain. Um, so basically that means even if you slow down blood flow just a little bit, it can cause you to go unconscious. In fact, and I'll kind of bring me back so you can kind of see my mannerisms, I guess. Um, so basically you have large arteries coming up the side of your neck. These are your carotid arteries. Um, and what ends up happening sometimes with the elderly, you know, as you get older, you get um, like plaque buildup in your blood vessels, right? That can obstruct blood flow. Well, sometimes what happens is they'll turn their heads to look at something, right? And that'll crimp one of the blood vessels. And by crimping that blood vessels, it slows the blood flow going to the brain. So you'll sometimes what will happen is they'll look, they'll get dizzy, and they'll fall down. Um, and then, you know, they, you know, hopefully they don't hurt their heads or anything like that take them to hospital, doctors will go in there, um, they'll, they'll clean out the, the artery and restore blood flow going to the brain. Okay, but that is a, that is a concern. So it, again, even a slow amount of flow can cause unconsciousness. And I'm sure you guys also know this. I mean, you've probably all seen enough wrestling or MMA or something like that. You know, they put like a, what they call it chokehold. Um, really what they're doing is they're simply, you know, stopping that blood flow going to the brain so you pass out. And when you get into two, I'm trying to think, and when you get into 202, you'll talk a little bit more about the different physiology of the body. And you want to really keep in mind, your, your body is going to do a lot to try to protect the brain because basically you can have all the other organs, you know, and they may not work that great and you can still survive. But if your brain's not working, you know, pretty much game over, right? So your body's going to do a lot. It's going to try to compensate a lot to make sure that everything is going okay with the brain. All right, hide me again here so you can see this picture better. Okay, because the brain is so important, we want to make sure that not everything gets to the brain. We want to protect it from any kind of harmful thing that might be in the bloodstream. Okay, so to do that, we have something called the blood-brain barrier. So basically what that is is a, a tight junction. So that's what that J and X is. It's a tight junction of epithelial cells, um, and those cells are made be made permeable more or less by astrocytes. So here in this image, these are the epithelial cells. They're making up the actual blood vessel. And you can see here are these tight junctions. So basically it's not letting much of anything through. And then hopefully you can see here these astrocytes and they're sending these projections, these foot processes as this image says, around the epithelial cells of the blood vessel, maintaining that permeability. Um, and in fact, you can these astrocytes will take up a lot of the nutrients and simply pass that along to the neuron, as you can see in the background here. Um, and in this image too, you'll, you'll see these oligodendrocytes, which hopefully you remember from a previous chapter, maintain that myelin sheath in the central nervous system. So again, you want to make sure you're protecting that brain from any kind of harmful substance. Now, that doesn't mean that things don't get through, because they do. Okay, um, so for example, uh, because glucose is so important, we're going to have lots of mechanisms ensuring that it actually gets through this blood-brain barrier, the BBB. So glucose will get through other things, certain ions, um, other uh, uh, molecules will get through, um, albeit slowly, 
uh, there is no fast kind of transport through. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of proteins and antibiotic drugs don't get through. Um, they tend to be water soluble, so uh, hydrophilic. Um, remember that we have a cell membrane. They don't cross that cell membrane very easily. You have to have transporters. You do not have transporters in this case. So what ends up happening is that if you have a brain infection, it's really hard to deliver the antibacterials or even antivirals um, to combat whatever it is that might have gotten across a blood-brain barrier um, because simply the drugs don't get through. So sometimes they'll have to try to force the permeability of this blood-brain barrier to sort of push things through. But as you can imagine that if we're trying to squeeze things through these tiny little blood vessels, sometimes it does more harm um, than it does good or it causes you know, harm as well as benefits, I guess. Um, things that are lipid soluble, on the other hand, get through. So these are the hydrophobic things, um, particularly like alcohol. This is one of the reasons why alcohol has, you know, those effects that it does. That's why it makes you drunk because it gets right through that blood brain barrier. Um, so, you know, it, and it'll affect the way that neurons function. And we'll, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the effects that you see a little bit later on. Um, that's how anesthetics also work. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense to you. All right. Let's just talk a little bit about cerebral spinal fluid. Okay, so cerebral spinal fluid is going to basically bathe the brain, um, and really it's it's going to be super important. And it's and it's an amazing um, fluid. Like I'll see if I can find a video and I'll, and I'll put it up on Canvas for you. When you see a, a, a they'll do spinal taps sometimes to see if. Uh, people have any kind of infection going on in in the cerebral spinal fluid because obviously that can be really bad. Um, and when you see it, when you see it when it's there is no inf infection, it is it's actually really beautiful. It's almost like uh, crystal clear. Like when they say crystal clear, I mean it's crystal clear. It's like I don't. I, it's almost like liquid glass, I guess. It's really neat. I'll see if I can find a video that shows it very nicely for you. Um, in any case, one of the things that it does is it acts as a mechanical protection. Um, basically, you, you put your brain in a uh, bunch of fluid. So when you, you know, again, kind of move your head around, the fluid is buffering it. So you're not just like whacking into sides of the skull. That cerebral spinal fluid um, will also take the elements that are absolutely necessary from the bloodstream um, and then basically purifies them in, in a way. It just takes the things that are necessary and that's what the, the neurons get. So essentially, it, it creates an optimal environment for the neuron signaling. Okay, which is going to be really important because, again, these neurons are super important. So you want to make sure they have everything that they need to function properly because if they're not functioning properly, you're going to have lots of cognitive deficits, right? And that's not good for survival, right? Um, and then, you know, as these neurons are producing things, they're going to produce waste. And again, they're, they're hungry, so you're providing with nutrients as well as waste products. Okay. Um, if you remember back to one of the earlier lectures, um, we talked about uh, the cerebral spinal fluid being formed by the choroid plexus, and that's basically made by these ependymal cells. Um, it's basically capillaries and the ependymal cells together are creating this, what's known as a choroid plexus. It's sort of more like a body, and that, again, that body is called the choroid plexus, and that's capillaries and these ependymal cells working together. Okay, so basically they're going to filter they're going to take things from the bloodstream, as I just mentioned, and create that cerebral spinal fluid. Right? Then you have these separate structures called the arachnoid villi. Right? And so, I mean, think about this. If we're making fluid, we also have to reabsorb that fluid. Because if we're constantly making something and we're not reabsorbing it, it's just you're, you're basically more and more and more and more and more. And your head would balloon into, like, I don't know, a giant balloon or something like that. So, again, as you're making cerebral spinal fluid, you also have to reabsorb it and you're reabsorbing it back into the bloodstream. So you make the fluid, it bathes the skull, it'll also bathe the spinal cord, right? Um, and then these arachnoid villi, these specialized structures, will also have blood vessels on them. And as you make it, as the choroid plexus makes it, the arachnoid villi also reabsorbs it back into the bloodstream. Okay, so those wastes and stuff that the neurons produce basically get filtered by your kidneys. Right. So basically that's what this image is showing you. So here is your brain. Um, here's a little arachnoid villus right here. Oops, here's another one. Here's another one. 
So here's choroid plexus. It's producing the cerebral spinal fluid. And then you can see there's areas where it can get out, bathe around the brain, and it'll go around the spinal cord. So some of it stays inside the brain, and we'll see this in lab. You have these fluid-filled spaces in the brain. Those are going to be called ventricles. Um, and then you'll see that bathes the inside part of the brain, and then it also gets to the outside and bathes the outside of the brain. Okay, and again, these arachnoid villi will reabsorb any of the cerebrospinal fluid and return it back into the blood system. Okay, so one of the things that's kind of cool about the cerebrospinal fluid is that when you're sleeping, um, what ends up happening is that cerebral spinal fluid will flow along the blood vessels inside your brain and it'll help wash away any kind of excess proteins that might have built up throughout the day. And it's thought that that washing away of those excess proteins helps prevent things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. And one of the evidence for that is one of the first, I guess one of the things that is disrupted during Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease is sleep. So people have a hard time sleeping, have a hard time washing away uh, these excess proteins and plaque, um, and basically that exacerbates the cognitive deficits as exhibited in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense too. Now, I mentioned to you the arachnoid villi and how important it is to make sure that if we're creating cerebral spinal fluid, we're also draining it, right? Because if we don't, your head would balloon, 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 balloon. We do have a medical procedure called trepanning. And basically what trepanning is, is basically drilling a hole in the head, I should say in the skull, to relieve pressure due to excess cerebral spinal fluid. Okay, so when we have trepanning, and we do, and this happens all the time in, uh, in hospitals now, so people will come in, a lot of times they've suffered some sort of traumatic brain injury due to a car accident, let's say, um, and there's swelling going on in the brain in response, uh, and what they'll have to do is they'll drill a hole in the head, usually somewhere in the back, um, to, to drain any excess fluids so the brain itself, those neurons, aren't getting crushed by the excess fluid. Now, this is not a new procedure at all. As you can see in, in these images, hopefully you can tell, um, you know, this is not modern times. We don't wear, you know, funnels and books on our heads. Um, <laughs> and this is, you know, particularly gruesome looking. But people, like, and this is, this goes back to even before the Middle Ages, people recognized that, you know, if you had a headache, maybe it's due to too much excess fluid on, on the head, or more likely they kind of thought that, that people were possessed by evil spirits. So if the evil spirit's in your head, well, it's stuck there. So if I drill the hole in your head, the evil spirit could leave. Right? I know people weird, believe weird things. Um, but they had these surgeries, uh, and we have evidence from skulls, right? Like you can kind of see this one, that individuals actually survived these surgeries, which is absolutely remarkable when you think of, you know, they did not have very hygienic conditions back then. Um, and and again, in fact, you know, they do that today in, in hospitals. And uh, some people, uh, even today, uh, there's actually, you can, you can Google this, there's an American Trepanning Society. And it's a group that basically believes that this should be a procedure that's more widely offered. Like they think that a lot of people who suffer from migraines, it's due to an excess amount of cerebral spinal fluid. Um, and if only they could, you know, drill a hole in their head, they could relieve that excess pressure and they wouldn't have migraines anymore. And so here I'll tell you the guys a little story. Um, the website these days looks very professional and much better than it used to be. So about, I don't know, this is a while back, like 10 years ago or so, um, when they're sort of, I guess, newer, uh, the president of the society was this, this guy, I can't remember his name. Um, and he, had, on, the, on, the, on their website, they had, you know, it was, it was sort of his story and sort of him advocating for trepanning, you know, being offered as sort of an elective, elective surgery. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so the story goes that he, you know, he'd been suffering from these really bad migraines like all the time. And he, you know, I guess the guy was just really desperate for some sort of solution and modern medicine was just not offering it to him. So he, he was convinced that trepanning was the cure. So he decided to, to operate on himself. 
So what he did is he got some local anesthesia. I don't know where he got it from. I don't know, maybe it was ice. I have no idea. But somehow he numbed the area. Um, and then he got a drill, you know, like, I don't know, like your Black & Decker drill, right? Stuck it to his head and drilled. Um, now, I will say that on his website at the time, I think he said he tried it five or six times before it worked. And I don't, and he doesn't elaborate, or he didn't, I should say, elaborate on like what went wrong. But all I can imagine, I don't know if you guys ever use a drill, but you know, like you, you start like, zing, and it kind of <laughs> moves on you. So I don't know what happened, but all I know is like he had tried several times, failed. And then finally, I guess he got it to go in. And he said that it felt like a, he had heard a pop. And then all of a sudden he could feel like a warm fluid dripping down his face. And that's how he knew he had gotten into that pocket where the cerebral spinal fluid is in that uh, arachnoid space. Um, so yeah, and then I guess he hasn't suffered from migraines since. So that was sort of his little pro trepanning thing. I, I, I don't advocate that, you know, at all. That's extreme body modification that, you know, whatever you do, don't put a drill to your head. I'm actually going to stop there, this lecture right there. Um, so let me know if you have any questions, uh, and hopefully that was kind of clear. Uh, one thing I, I don't think I made very clear was that the cerebral spinal fluid is found in that arachnoid space. So in between that dura mater and that pia mater, in that arachnoid space um, is where you're going to find the cerebral spinal fluid, as well as inside the ventricles, those fluid-filled parts of the brain, which you will see in lab, um, is the, the other area where you're going to find cerebral spinal fluid. Okay. See you next time.